Well, it's a few decades back, actually almost half a century, that I had been working as a young scientist on microbial genetics. At that moment, uh, that had just become possible since a relatively short time, uh, maybe uh, a decade before I started in this field. It had been discovered that uh, a nucleic acid DNA carries genetic information and Watson Crick had published the structure of DNA, which made clear how the inf information could be stored in DNA. Now, um, uh, microbial genetics helped very much then in the coming time really to understand uh, how one could analyze uh, sp specific gene functions because one had to sort out uh, active genes, growing them up to study structure and function. And uh, then uh, that did really lead, thanks to microbial genetics, to uh, understand not only microbial gene, uh, gene functions, but also gene functions on any other living beings. Um, some of the knowledge which came from microbial genetics helped, in fact, to devise uh, research strategies like genetic engineering to sort out genes, to grow them up, to analyze them from any uh, type of organism. And uh, later on, it was becoming clear that one could also use this method uh, in order to uh, produce particular substances which may be uh, of medical importance but also for of importance for our daily nutrition. Uh, uh, so I think um, looking at now some distance on this development, it was very fortunate to have questions which could not be easily be answered by uh, classical research strategies, but having novel research strategies largely based on small organisms like bacteria, like viruses, one could uh, deepen more and more uh, our knowledge on uh, the function of life. Well, once uh, it was clarified that uh, restriction is a phenomenon which you largely see in practically all bacteria, but not really in higher organisms. Uh, in bacteria, uh, the DNA is, I would say, floating in the cytoplasm rather than forming chromosomal structures like in higher organisms, uh, having a, a more uh, complex structural appearance. Um, now, uh, with that, it, it was possible uh, to uh, question what does, is the function of restriction enzymes. Maybe I should say uh, it was clear that when bacterial cells show the phenomenon of restriction, that means that whenever foreign DNA enters a cell by one mean or another, one mean can be by viral infection, but it also could be by it that bacterial DNA penetrates uh, by some other way into the inside of another kind of bacterial cell, or by conjugation, which is cell-cell contact, in which uh, we also know that under particular condition, DNA can be transferred from a donor cell to a recipient cell. Under all these conditions, uh, if you infect a cell having restriction enzymes, uh, the, the incoming DNA is identified as foreign, is cut into fragments, and other enzymes then uh, cut the fragments relatively rapidly, just within a few minutes, into uh, single nucleotides. Um, it is, however, possible that these linear fragments which uh, come about by 
the cutting of restriction enzymes are what we call recombinogenic. They try to find some way to go into the genome of the infected host. Sometimes at low frequency they succeed. And it can happen that uh, this acquisition of foreign genetic information is a, a big advance in the evolutionary development of that infected cell. Usually it is not, but at low probability it can represent that advance. So it became clear to me and to my colleagues that restriction in a way uh, is a mean, natural mean, first of all to keep so-called horizontal transfer of genetic information at very low rates and secondly stimulating uh, incorporation of small segments of foreign uh, genetic information. Still today, in large populations of, let's say, biologists and also the general public, one thinks that all too much of our life is guided uniquely by genetic information. Uh, one new development which um, has been uh, more intensively worked on in the last, well, 10 years or so, is uh, what is called epigenetic. That is uh, having some influence on the phenotype without having changed the genetic information to start with. And I, I'm a bit, bit proud to see that uh, we studying restriction modification systems in the 1960s, we were among the first really to clarify one of such epigenetic phenomenon, which is when um, a bacterial cell has a particular restriction endonuclease, of course, the cell has to be very careful to protect its own genome from the action of these endonucleases, so that the, own, the cell's own DNA is not cut also into fragments and degraded. Uh, that would be the death. Now that is done uh, by site-specific, sequence-specific addition of a metal group into a, a relatively short sequence. Short can be a sequence of four, six, eight, or a few more nucleotides. And one particular uh, nucleotide, uh, for example, an adenine, can become methylated and the metal group is attached such that it's outside and doesn't affect the proper replication nor uh, the, the reading in the transcription for uh, RNA and then for protein synthesis. So it doesn't affect the genes, but it is added within the genome. And that protects against cleavage by restriction enzymes. Now, this is a, a, a typical situation of epigenetics, that uh, another gene function uh, does something to the, to the DNA without changing in any way uh, the, the genetic information. Uh, that is, as far as I can see, the first time that it was clearly shown that, uh, how that works. And Epigenetics is a more broad thing, uh, affecting uh, some properties of a living cell uh, without changing the genetic information. There are various ways to do that, and I think in the next few decades we will learn much more on that. So, dependence on environmental factors, for example.